This Calvin and Hobbes cartoon is a wonderful thought-provoking way to start our discussion on solid waste, waste disposal, and recycling. There are many different types of solid waste, but we're only going to look at one particular type, and that is MSW, municipal solid waste. Now municipal solid waste is the posh name for trash. So this includes all of the waste thrown away from homes, restaurants down in the town, local businesses in town, and any small industries that are found down in the uh, municipal area, such as in our local town we have some bars, some restaurants, a frame shop, a small print and press, and the like. So when these homes, businesses, and establishments have items that they no longer want to use because they're broken or they're spoiled, or they just don't want to use them anymore just because they're out of fancy, this would be considered municipal solid waste. They're going to put it in their garbage cans, put it in their dumpsters, and once it's in the dumpster, it's going to be carried away for disposal. Now the United States produces large amounts, about 210 million metric tons of municipal solid waste each year. So that works out to be round about 4.5 pounds of trash per person per day. The amount of municipal solid waste generated by the United States increases every year. And there's two real reasons as to why the amount of municipal solid waste keeps going up. So I want you to think about what those two reasons are. Why is the amount of municipal solid waste increasing? The first reason is population growth. The population is increasing, and as the population grows, therefore each person is throwing away waste, and therefore the total amount of waste disposed of by the community would increase. So population growth um, accounts for some of that increase in MSW. The other reason is lifestyle. As a population becomes more developed, as it becomes more industrialized, uh, people tend to use more goods, and those goods tend to become disposable. So we've developed what's called a consumer society. TV commercials and print commercials um, are always pushing our population to buy more stuff, to get more stuff, to get rid of that old one and replace it with this new model. So we produce items that we very quickly don't want anymore and replace those with new items. Those items we don't want become part of our municipal solid waste. So if we look at less developed countries, they often produce much less waste per person than a more developed country does. And that's simply because of affluence. In less developed nations, the people can't buy all of the goods that we buy here in the United States, and therefore they don't have the ability to, keep, to throw all that stuff away. They don't have it in the first place. The second reason being, when they do have an item, they can't afford to replace it, so they're much more likely to try and repair an item or fix an item if it does break. So they're much more likely to have shaving implements that they um, would repair, that is, that they would sharpen over its lifetime and use it for many, many, many years. Whereas in the United States, we're much more likely to buy uh, a shaver that we use a couple of times. As soon as it gets blunt, we just throw it away and take out a new one. If we look at the material that's found in municipal solid waste or found in our trash coming out of our homes, this is the general breakdown. So we've got most of the trash tends to be paper products and then works down through the other products, metals, glass, plastics and food waste. Now, of all the different topics that we talk about in the course, trash is pretty simple to fix. Because if you just took a general college class of students and just said, all right, paper waste, what should we be doing with it? Um, they're all going to say, oh yeah, we shouldn't be throwing it away, it should be recycled. And if we look at the metal products, what should we be doing with those? And most students will instantly grab on that we should be uh, recycling them. So uh, a lot of this is not what should we be doing with the products. It's how do we make people do what they should be doing with the products. So let's just quickly run down what we could do with each of these, just as a, an introduction, and then we'll look in a little bit more detail at how we can deal with the trash. So what should we be doing with paper? Paper should be recycled. 
Now recycling um, works with only some types of paper. Uh, not all cardboards are actually recyclable in every municipality, so only certain paper types can actually be recycled. And also paper that has food products on it or greases and oils on it isn't recyclable. So only clean paper gets to be recycled. So we can't just dump it in the trash and then throw our dinner on top of the paper and expect that to be recyclable. We've got to actually separate it out, our newsprint and our high quality office to type paper, and then make sure that those are recycled. Even the ones that have had food in them could be placed in an incinerator and utilized to make energy in that way, to make electricity. Or if you have the ability to digest down uh, the lignin that's in the paper, you could convert it into methane in a methane digester. So a lot of this paper, if it's not recycled, can be used to produce energy sources. Yard waste is the next major portion of municipal solid waste and this right here can be composting down which is one way of recycling it back into fertilizer. So composting of uh, grass clippings and uh, leaves during the autumn is a great way of removing this waste. Again, it's not really trash that needs to be disposed of. This can be used to generate energy. So you could burn it um, if it was a dry waste, or we could put it into a methane digester or an alcohol fermenter and generate methane from its decay or alcohol from its breakdown. The rubber textiles and wood group is much more complex because it's so mixed. Now if it's wood and we have the ability to break down lignin, if we can develop that ability to do um, cellulasic ethanol production, then we could digest down that wood and use it to make uh, alcohol and that alcohol would then be able to be used as a fuel source. Of course we can always burn it in an incinerator and you can generate electricity from the heat that's produced for that wood. But the rubbers and textiles are much more um, problematic. Uh, they have a lot of mixture of chemicals in them and make them difficult to deal with. So a big chunk of this is going to become municipal solid waste. Metals are the most recyclable material that's out there. If you melt down one aluminium can or aluminium can you get enough usable metal to make one aluminium can. So it's very close to being 100% recyclable which means that metals should be placed into our recycling system and recycled. At the very beginning of the quarter um, we started talking about the high quality matter and low quality matter and how the metal, when we condense it down and make it high quality, um, that's what drives our more developed country's economy. And how we can't afford in a sustainable society to take that high quality matter and throw it away. It takes large amounts of energy to produce high quality matter. When you mm -hmm. have it, you have to keep on using it. So we really need to be recycling our metals. And the good news is that the uh, United States steel industry is a fantastic recycler. They really have some of the best recycling rates of any industry in the entire world. So as long as we can get our municipalities to do that same thing, recycling of metal beverage cans and food cans should be extremely high. Glass can also be recycled, but it is not 100% recyclable. If you take a soda bottle, a glass soda bottle, or a glass beer bottle and melt it down, because you get degraded quality, because the glass would not be the same quality, you can't make a complete new glass bottle out of it. What we do is we grind the glass down and add it to the new materials so that it's much less energy intensive to make glass. So it reduces the amount of energy needed to produce the new glass bottle. Now it saves us lots of energy and it saves us lots of materials so it's definitely more sustainable to recycle glass but is not a 100% recyclable material. You have to add new materials to it each time. Plastics 
Plastics are another mixed group and as we'll see later the different types of plastic mean that sometimes this is easy to recycle, sometimes it's difficult to recycle. Some plastics are readily recyclable and should be recycled often. Some plastics are very difficult to recycle and therefore are not normally collected for recycling purposes. And then food waste. Well food waste then goes into the yard waste type category. We can compost it. You can, if it's a dry enough waste, burn it in an incinerator to make electricity. But the fact that um, a lot of food waste is damp means that burning it is not a very efficient way of dealing with that waste. So it's normally more efficient to put it into a methane digester and utilize the bacteria to make methane gas out of it. Or to put it in ethanol fermenter to generate ethanol from it. So in a perfect world, if we had perfect recycling technology and alcohol production technology and methane production technology, um, most of this graph would actually not be municipal solid waste. It would no longer be waste. It would be feedstock going into alcohol production or compost production or methane production or energy production or recycled material. So in the ideal world, the amount of municipal solid waste that we have would actually be very small. What we actually see is the amount of trash is going up each year. And of particular importance down at the bottom right hand side here is the amount of plastics that are increasing in our municipal solid waste every year. As our material moves towards a plastic economy, as everything becomes wrapped in plastic, sealed in plastic, or made out of plastic, the amount of plastic in our trash increases. This is problematic because plastics are difficult to recycle. If it had been metal, then metal is 100% recyclable, that wouldn't have been an issue. But with plastics, it's very difficult to recycle some types of plastic. So we're really designing our economy to not be able to recycle all of the items that we're producing. We're not developing a sustainable economy. We're developing a consumer economy. And if you want to become a sustainable economy, then you just have to develop your goods so that they are either recyclable or reusable or biodegradable so that we can use them for composting. But that's not what we have right now. Right now we have a, an economy that produces lots of consumables and they lead to lots and lots of municipal waste. So what are we going to do with all of this trash? The first thing we can do with it is we can just throw it away. We can generate municipal solid waste, we can throw it into the garbage can and have it carried away. Traditionally when we did this, that trash was just carried out of the city and just dumped and in some places, before it got carried out of the city, it was just dumped inside the city. And it was just piled high in open dumps. Now, as we became more developed, we started actually putting it in a hole in the ground rather than just an open dump. And this was called a landfill. We would got a hole in the ground, we were filling the land. And now in modern times, we've actually changed the way that these dumps are built. And we're now calling them sanitary landfills. So we're going to start with looking at open dumps and then we're going to compare them to the modern sanitary landfill. Now in the picture here we've got an open dump idea where the trash is just collected, hauled off and piled up one on top of the other. And obviously there's some big downsides for doing that. One of the first downsides is something called leachate. Now if you think about a leech, a leech is an animal that sticks on you and sucks stuff from you, so sucks your blood. Leech 8 is the fluid that comes from this trash once rain comes on it and it percolates down through the trash. So if you can imagine all of the things that are in the trash, as water filters down through that trash it collects all of those chemicals. Those chemicals become the leach 8. The substances in that soup of liquid that's coming out the bottom of the trash. Now of course as it soaks down into the ground, as it infiltrates the ground, it carries with it all of those chemicals. If it runs off, then it will run off the ground and carry those chemicals with it into the local water sources. And that means that those chemicals can find their way into our drinking water. So leachate is a problem with this system because they are completely open. 
and as rain passes through these mounds of trash it will leach out all of these unwanted chemicals and the chemicals are a huge range all these different chemicals from uh, cleaners that are thrown out in the trash to uh, heavy metals from batteries that are disposed of in the trash to pesticides and herbicides that people throw away to biological things because you remember that if you have a cold or you're menstruating the paper products you use to clean that up a lot of them will get thrown in the trash and end up here those biological contaminants will then be washed out so producing toxic and potentially toxic leachate is definitely a big downside of open dumping Open dumps also provide a big refuge for certain types of wildlife that are not particularly helpful for mankind. Open dumps provide housing and food supplies for the rodents, so we have large numbers of rats and mice growing in the area. They provide a food supply for large numbers of seagulls, so we get a boom in the seagull population. And also they tend to have large amounts of plastic bags. And if you can imagine when it rains, all of these little plastic bags catch little cups of water. So if you've ever left plastic outside and after a rainstorm gone out, you'll see that it's like tons and tons of miniature little uh, swimming pools just caught in the plastic there. Well, this provides a wonderful breeding ground for mosquitoes. So these trash dumps are therefore breeding grounds for mice, rats, mosquitoes and seagulls. And these animals then can transfer biological hazards, things like disease-causing agents, from the trash back into our population. So these animals lead to the movement of items from the trash dump back into the population, and that's a real big downside of open dumping. Remember that organic matter, when it decays, produces methane or methane. So with all this plastic in this area, there is a decreased amount of oxygen in the de decomposing trash. And this low oxygen condition readily leads to the production of methane. So this open dump is producing methane that it's releasing into the atmosphere. Now methane is a greenhouse gas. So it is contributing to the rise in temperature on the planet. Not only is it a greenhouse gas, it is also a valuable energy source that we're just wasting by releasing it into the atmosphere. So by just open dumping, we're really wasting uh, a good energy source in the form of methane, and instead that methane is passing into our atmosphere and acting as a pollutant, uh, changing the temperature of the planet. And the final downside that we're going to cover for open dumps is all of the loss of high quality energy sources. So we know that in here there's going to be batteries with uh, metals that were vital for our economy. There's going to be cans, both aluminum and steel cans, that should have been recycled to help our economy. There's going to be glass that could have decreased the energy needs of our glass manufacturers. So just the loss of high quality materials into an open dump is not sustainable. So we've got to change that if we're going to produce a truly sustainable society. So open dumping is not the most efficient way of dealing with your municipal solid waste. What we do today with our municipal solid waste when we want to throw it away is place it into a sanitary landfill. Now there are a few things different between our old dumps and a modern sanitary landfill. The first one is that each day the trash is covered with six inches of compacted earth. So we're going to put six inches of compacted earth over that day's trash, smash it down with the machines. Now what's the benefit of covering the trash with this compacted earth? The main benefit is that it prevents mosquitoes and seagulls and so many rodents being able to carry that trash away or find homes to live. By sealing over the plastic trash we prevent those little pools of water forming and dramatically decrease the number of mosquitoes found in the dump. 
by sealing in the trash we prevent seagulls from coming down and feeding on that trash so we're pushing down our biological vector numbers vectors are organisms that carry biological agents or chemical agents from one area to another so by decreasing the number of seagulls in that area we're preventing them picking up trash and carrying those pollutants out of the dump site the landfill is also built with a liner. This liner prevents leachate from coming out of the trash. So it prevents water from percolating through the trash, collecting all of those chemicals, and carrying the chemicals into our waterways. So this waterproof liner then traps all of this fluid inside the landfill. Now obviously you can't just leave the fluid in the landfill or it would fill up like a swimming pool. So there's also a leachate collecting system. The leachate's the liquid and it's just a series of pipes that are used to suck that liquid out of the landfill. Now the problem with the liquid is it's a mixture of unknown chemicals. You don't really know what's in it. If we wanted to collect usable chemicals from that leachate that's very very difficult and expensive to do because the leachate changes each month or each day. We find it easy to develop chemical treatments that if the liquids that we're trying to treat are constant in their composition. If the leachate has a constant composition then we can design chemical processes to extract the metals and extract usable chemicals from it. But when the chemical leachate alters all the time, designing a process that will cheaply, the key term there is cheaply, and successfully collect chemicals each week is very, very difficult. So for most dumps, what they do is they just collect the leachate, put it in a plastic barrel, seal it in there, and put the barrel back in the landfill. That way, the liquid is prevented from leaking out. Uh, it's contained within the landfill and we do not have the problem of harmful chemicals getting into our air or into our water sources. Third part that we've got to look at is this gas recovery system. A series of pipes that aren't collecting liquid but are collecting the methane gas that are produced by the decay of the trash. Now these gas recovery systems work in two ways. One way is they just collect the gas and allow it to escape into the air. And this prevents a, uh, a build-up of potentially explosive methane within the landfill. A much more sustainable approach is to have gas recovery where the gas is actually collected and harnessed. And there are a number of methane collecting landfills around the Georgia area where that methane is collected burn and used to generate electricity. So modern sanitary landfills overcome many of the problems that are seen in open dumps. As we write laws to mean that landfills have to meet certain standards and therefore can be called sanitary landfills, this means that smaller and older landfills have to be closed because they don't have the lining or the gas recovery or the leachate recovery systems. As those older landfills close, it means that the number of landfills found in the United States decreases each year. These modern standards also mean that it's more expensive to open a brand new landfill. So what we find is the number of landfills in the US is going down. And this is definitely problematic. The amount of trash is going up, but the amount of landfill space is going down. Not only is this for some economic reasons, the cost of actually putting in all the lining and the leachate collecting and the gas collecting systems, it's also for political reasons. NIMBY is an acronym that stands for Not In My Backyard. I'm sure if somebody wanted to build a landfill uh, right behind your mum and dad's house, you would definitely not be in favour of that and you wouldn't want to get your mom and dad or your friends and neighbors together to try and put political pressure on to stop the siting of that landfill. So every time we try and put a landfill in an, in an area, NIMBY groups crop up. 
where local inhabitants are trying to stop the landfill being built because it's going to have huge impacts on the price of their property. Their house price will drop, they're going to see large amounts of their investments lose money. There's also another idea that's called NIM2. NIM2 stands for not in my term of office. So not in my term of office is the idea that a politician that votes to put a landfill in an area where residents don't want it will just be voted out at the next election. So they are under tremendous pressure to not vote for those landfills. So this is then pushing down the number of landfills. When one's closed, we find it much more difficult to open a new landfill to replace it. The decrease in number of landfills causes the problem of supply and demand. The demand for trash removal keeps going up, but the supply of places to throw away our trash goes down. And that has an effect on the price. So as the number of landfills in an area decreases, the cost to throw away per ton of garbage increases. So I use this slide just because it reminds me that I'm supposed to talk about the price of throwing away trash. Um, and you can see that it's an old slide. Um, the prices do not match what we see today. I just like it because it says you can throw a car away for 10 bucks. And then on the right hand side it says, but the kids must remain in the vehicle. Just a little humorous slide there. But the whole idea is that it gets more and more expensive to throw our trash away each year. And the expense of throwing the trash away varies from state to state. If states have enough landfills, then they can throw away, dispose of their trash economically, and their costs will be fairly low. That's exactly what Georgia's like. Georgia has large amounts of land. We have large numbers of landfill space. The cost of actually disposing of municipal solid waste within Georgia is fairly low. New Jersey, on the other hand, has very small amounts of landfill space, and the cost to dispose of trash within New Jersey is extremely expensive. Now, one way that New Jersey copes with this is rather than disposing of its waste inside its own borders, it actually transports that waste to neighboring states. So we have states that will import municipal solid waste from their neighbors and utilize that as a revenue stream. So New Jersey pays other states to dispose of its trash. And then we have states where disposal of trash is extremely expensive and they find it economical to pay to ship their trash to other states. Now obviously this is not sustainable. At some point Pennsylvania and Virginia were going to fill up their landfills and as their landfills close they'll face the same NIM2 and NIMBY problems and expense problems of siting a new landfill. So trash, even though it is economical right now, to dispose of it in landfills, eventually it will not be economical for most of our industrialized states, our high density population states. It is an interesting thing to think about though. Should your state supplement its tax income by importing trash from a more populous state? So for example, should Georgia take trash from New Jersey? Now, at one point, New Jersey and Georgia were in talks about having trash imported from New Jersey into Georgia. And ultimately, those talks didn't lead to anywhere. But there was discussion as to whether we should actually import trash from New Jersey. And we'd get paid for every ton of trash that came into our borders to be disposed of. Interesting problem. Should we take trash from elsewhere so that we can make money from it? If we decide then we're not going to throw away as much municipal solid waste because we just physically don't have space in our landfills or that putting it in the landfill is just too expensive, what else can we do with it? And our next option is to incinerate it, to burn it. Now by incineration we don't mean open burning. We don't mean just setting fire to the landfill. We mean actually taking the trash to an incinerator and burning it in a controlled manner. We currently incinerate about 15% of municipal solid waste. And it's not just a method to decrease the amount of waste that needs to be disposed of. We also capture the heat from that burning process 
and use it to generate electricity. So this would be a waste to energy system. We're turning waste into usable energy. Now there's two actual types of incinerator. The first type is called a mass burn incinerator. And in a mass burn incinerator, all that happens is that we take all of the trash, it's fed into a giant hopper that leads to a grinder, that grinds the trash very, very finely. Then that trash is fed into the furnace, burnt, and generates heat. So anything that's put in the trash is burnt in a mass burn incinerator. So the major problem with a mass burn incinerator is the production of primary air pollutants. Anything that's in the trash is going to be ground up and try to be burnt. So if there's car batteries in the trash, they'll be ground up and then fed into the combustion chamber. And obviously these car batteries won't burn because most of them is made out of uh, a lump of lead. But that lead will be turned into particles within the smoke that's coming out of the incinerator. Particulate pollution that includes lead is extremely bad for human health, causing damage to memory and brain function. Other batteries are also made out of heavy metals, like lithium or cadmium. So just throwing away batteries such as on your cell phone or other rechargeable items are incredibly bad for the health of your population once they're put through an incinerator. It's not just heavy metals and batteries, it's also all of the cleaning products, computer products, and electrical items that are put into the incinerator. It's also plastics. Large numbers of plastics, when they're burnt, generate what are called estrogen mimics. These are chemicals that match uh, very similarly the chemical formula of female hormones. And these female hormone mimics, these estrogen mimics, uh, may have an effect on the functioning of the tissues and cells and organs within the body. So by burning absolutely everything, mass burn incinerators definitely have a large impact on the air quality near our municipalities. They also generate ash, the leftover burn products that are highly concentrated in toxic materials. Not all of that lead from the battery comes out in the smoke. Large amounts of it will be concentrated in the ash that's left after the combustion. So this ash now is much more highly toxic than the trash was originally. It's been concentrated. One way around the problem of mass burn systems is instead to develop what's called a refuse-derived fuel system. Refuse-derived fuel is trash that has been picked over to remove the non-burnable sections. So you have to have an inspection station where the trash will be inspected and separated out. So the batteries would be removed. The plastics would be removed for recycling. The metals that after all are not going to burn, they're just going to decrease the efficiency of your system are removed for recycling. Glass is removed for recycling. So what gets burnt is just the burnable materials. Now because you've removed lots and lots of the non-burnable or hazardous materials, the air quality in a refuse to our fuel system is much higher. The downside is all of that upfront work and sorting costs money. Therefore, by having to put in all of this sorting effort, the refuse derived fuel systems are not as economical to run. So both of these incinerators have problems. One is they're expensive and therefore the energy they make is expensive and one is it leads to large amounts of air pollution. And it's for these reasons that the EPA have generally not pushed incineration as part of the United States' approach to reducing the amount of municipal solid waste. There are nations around the world that rely heavily on incinerators but the US is not one of them. So we've done throwing it away, putting it in landfills, we've done burning it, and now we're going to do composting it. How can we utilize our trash to generate mulch? So mulch is organic material that you use to add soil to control the growth of unwanted vegetation. It can also be mixed in with soil to improve its quality, to change the color of it, to mean that it will grab more water and hold on to that water for longer periods, and so that the soil has more nutrients in it. Organic material that's in our trash can be composted to produce mulch. 
Composting basically means just to let it rot. So we're going to deliberately produce conditions that allow this organic matter to rot. So tree limbs can be ground up, leaves, whether it be grass clippings or from deciduous trees dropping their leaves during the autumn. They're all collected together with our food waste and all of these organic materials are decayed down to generate our mulch. Now a fair number of states are trying to remove this organic matter from their trash before they send it to the landfill. Organic matter tends to weigh large amounts, therefore costs a lot to put in the landfill, and with landfill space decreasing, they understand that they just can't afford to throw decayable material into the landfill. The textbook talks about three different ways of utilizing organic material to make mulch, so make sure you've read that section of the chapter. So now we're into recycling. Recycling is when you take a product, break it down and reform it into a completely new product. It doesn't have to be a new type of product. For example, an aluminium beer can can be broken down and formed into a new beer can, but it does have to be a completely brand new product. It has to be dismantled, reprocessed and made into something new. In environmental circles, we'll often hear of the three R's. The three R's being reduce, reuse, and recycle. So the three R's work together in that order. Reduce being the most environmentally friendly. Reuse being the next most environmentally friendly. And then recycling being the least environmentally friendly of the three. Reduce, reuse, recycle are three key ways of dealing with excessive amounts of municipal waste. So we're going to approach this by starting with the least efficient way of dealing with municipal solid waste and then move towards the most efficient way. So we're going to do the three R's from least efficient towards most efficient. So of the three R's, recycling is the least efficient. However, recycling is one of the best environmental success stories of the 20th and 21st century. As the United States has tried to deal with um, decreasing space in landfills and increase in municipal solid waste, there's been a very large recycling effort. Now, recycling metals, recycling glass, recycling paper and recycling plastic has many, many benefits. If we're just dealing with conservation of the resource, recycling is a fantastic way to go. It means that you have to dig up less sand to generate glass. You have to dig up less rock to get iron ore or aluminium ore from it. So the resource will last for longer and truly that is a sustainable approach. It also reduces pollution. If you're making products from recyclable items, whether it be recycled glass or recycled metal or recycled plastic, you actually need to use less energy to produce those items. So recycled glass is produced at cooler temperatures, so it takes less energy. Recycled metal is produced at cooler temperatures, so it takes less energy. They produce less air pollution because you're not having to burn as much coal to make the electricity. And just making plastics from plastics produces less air pollution to start with. There's jobs creation because people have to collect those recyclable items and sort them. So we actually are feeding an economic need. And of course the whole point is that with more recycling we actually take up less landfills. So we reduce the cost of having to throw away trash and we mean the landfills that we have right now will last for longer. But compared to just landfilling our trash, recycling has many, many benefits. Now the key to actually doing efficient recycling is to separate the recyclables from the trash before they're thrown away. We talked briefly about the papers and if you put um, food waste on top of the paper how it becomes non-recyclable. Well a huge amount of the cost in doing recyclable materials is separating the recyclable materials from the trash, physically handling it and doing that separation. 
if we can get people to separate the recycles right at their source, right at the house, then recycling becomes much cheaper and a much easier option. So how are we going to get people to separate out their recyclable materials from the rest of their trash? This is something that you need to think about so you can bring it to the discussion. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in this particular picture, uh, this municipality sells the yellow trash bags. So on trash day, you put out your yellow garbage bags and the company come along and collect it and carry it away. They only collect trash in those yellow garbage bags. If you went to Walmart and bought your own trash bags, then they wouldn't be collected. Now you can see the recycle bins. The recycle bins are collected for free. So any recyclable items in, in the recycle bins, that's collected free of charge. The trash bags, you have to buy. And these trash bags were $5 a piece. So putting trash out for this house here is cost them $10 for this week's amount of trash. That's very expensive. That is an expensive trash collection. Now if you'd have noticed, if they had not have recycled these items, they'd have had to buy more yellow trash bags, and therefore there's a big carrot and stick approach. The carrot is, if you recycle the items, it doesn't cost you as much. You save money by separating out the recyclables. The stick is, if you can't be bothered to do your recycling, then it's going to cost you large amounts. You're going to have to buy more yellow bags, and that's going to cost you a lot more. So that was one way to try and encourage people to do source separation, to separate their recyclables from the rest of their trash. Now, it's really not that difficult to do. Rather than just having one trash can, you have to have multiple trash cans, and you just sort through the trash as you do this. I know it's not difficult to do, because this is how it works at my house. Convincing people that they need to set this up is the key. And I do want you to come up with some ways that you could implement in your society to try and cause source separation. As you do it, think of it as a carrot and stick approach. The carrot is what's the benefit? How will the person benefit if they do the action you want them to do? The stick is what's going to happen if they don't do it? What's their incentive to make sure they do it? Because if they don't, something nasty is going to happen. So I'll give you one more example of how a municipality is trying to encourage recycling. So this example is a recycle bank. And what happens is you're given a plastic recyclables container that you put your recyclables in during trash day. That container has a little computer chip embedded into it. And each time the operator collects your recyclables, he measures, he weighs how much you've produced. And it's recorded into your account because of the little chip that's on your plastic box. Now, those amounts earn you points. So the more items you recycle, the more points you earn. And those points are redeemable at local stores. So all of a sudden, your recyclables are worth money. So that increased the rate of recycling in Philadelphia from 7% to about 90%. And that's a really, really big carrot approach. So if you do this, you can earn points that you can use to buy goods at certain stores. So that's an excellent carrot approach. What would be the stick? Well, the stick is if you don't do it, you don't earn any of that money. So your friends will be able to buy stuff at the local store for less money, and you'll just get to watch them buy stuff at the local store for less money, because you didn't change your behavior. So recycling keeps high-quality matter within our society. It means that industry uses the same high-quality matter over and over and over, which is definitely a sustainable approach. One thing we have to ensure, though, is that we don't just recycle our trash, we also have to buy goods that contain recycled materials. If we buy goods that contain recycled materials, then there is an economic incentive to produce goods 
from recycled materials. So we have to match the demand for recycled goods with the supply of recycled material. It is not enough to just take your newspapers and dump them in the recycle bin. You have to buy recycled paper. It's not enough for your office or your school to recycle their papers. They have to buy recycled paper to fill their photocopiers and printers. Now, if we can match the supply and demand, then the economy of recycling will work. If we don't match the demand for recycled goods with the amount of recycled materials we supply, then the price of that recyclable material will crash and it won't be economic. So what we have to do is we've got to make sure that people are making consumer choices based on the recyclability of those materials. Can it be recycled? And is it made with recycled materials already? If we can match those two things, then recycling will work and will be a sustainable activity. So remember the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. So we've just done recycle. Recycling is when you melt down a product and use it to make something completely different. So you're going to take that product, you're going to completely dismantle it, remanufacture it, and get a brand new product out of it. So that's recycling. What is reuse? Reuse is different because you don't dismantle the product, break it down, and then make a new product. Reuse is you use the old product multiple times. So for example, a reusable mug would be like a ceramic coffee mug, where you drink your coffee, wash the mug, drink your coffee, wash the mug, drink your coffee, wash your mug. You're using it multiple, multiple times. The opposite of that would be a paper coffee mug or a styrofoam coffee mug where you drink your coffee once and then throw it away. That is very, very wasteful in terms of energy and high quality matter. It's much more efficient to just reuse that coffee mug time and time again. Now reuse is more efficient than recycling because of energy use. When you recycle a product, when you take an aluminium can and you have to grind it up, melt it down, and generate new aluminium cans from it, that uses up large amounts of energy. Whereas if you just utilized a beer glass over and over and over again, there is no energy needed there apart from to wash and sterilize that glass. So utilizing products over and over again, refillable containers, is much better than recycling. So we've got recycling isn't quite as good as reuse. And the most efficient R would be reduce. Let's just not make the trash in the first place. Let's be more efficient. And this is often called source reduction. How can we decrease the amount of materials that were actually put in into our garbage can? So this doesn't just come from you at home trying to think about what goes into your garbage can. It also comes from the manufacturing process. So one way is to just manufacture products with less material in them. And by far probably the most important one that's been seen here is the manufacture of drinks bottles. It used to be that the plastic bottles that contain soda were extremely thick and contained large amounts of material. They've now become much, much lighter. So if we could go back in time and pick up a Coke bottle from the 1970s and compare that to a Coke bottle in the 1990s, you'd see that the 1990s bottle has much less plastic in it. And if we were to compare a 1990s bottle to a 2010-2011 bottle, you'd see that our 2011 bottle has much less plastic in it. As our technology and how to develop plastics and how to manufacture bottles has improved, we're using less and less material. The same has occurred with plastic bags. The grocery bags you get from Walmart are now significantly lighter, contain less plastic than they did during the 70s. 
so we're using less material to produce exactly the same product and in most cases a product that is actually superior that is stronger and more flexible and longer lasting so that would be reduction actually physically reducing the amount of material that goes into the bottle it would also be in development of packaging if we could package things so that they utilize less material and this is an area uh, that is a pet peeve for me if we just think about um, CDs you'll often find that your CD is packaged inside a plastic carton that carton is then sealed with plastic tape that is then put in plastic cling wrap that is then put in a plastic bag for you to bring home multiple layers of plastic that's really not needed if you could reduce the amount of plastic layers there that would be source reduction get rid of the plastic bag get rid of the cling tape and just leave the plastic sticky tape that seals it that's almost impossible to get off and the plastic clamshell that it's in so just being more efficient in our engineering and our design will also lead to production of much less trash so there we have the ways that we can reduce the amount of solid waste going into our landfills and make our landfills last longer and become more sustainable don't forget reduce reuse recycle in that order are the most efficient ways of dealing with your trash and then if you can't recycle it then you actually have to deal with the municipal solid waste to actually get rid of it and we could compost it or incinerate it the most non-sustainable option is always the one to throw it away in the landfill.